The next session is on design for sustainable living. And uh, in this session, the next three projects, uh, I think, pretty perfectly showcase how you can build um, everyday products uh, in a more sustainable way. And um, Justina will host or will moderate the next uh, uh, session. Uh, yeah, so welcome, Justina. Hello, so I will go on stage. <laughs> uh, hello again. So I'd like to invite first of the project who's going to have a little pitch. Fair cop, Mauricio. I let you the space on the stage. Okay. Yes, please. Maybe you can drink a little bit of it. So we start. Um, okay. Uh, thanks for you know, listening. Uh, basically, you, know, you, you see this kind of water. Uh, there's about a billion people uh, who have uh, to drink this kind of water. I'm sorry. About a billion people in the world that have access to this kind of water. It's not clean. Uh, it has bacteria and a lot of things, nasty things inside. And um, yeah, this is a very, very big problem. It's a global problem. And what we, uh, the, the FERCA project uh, basically is to develop a very small water filter that can filter bacteria and chemicals and that it can fit into a small uh, plastic bottle. Um, here at uh, POC, sorry, we'll be de developing this uh, design. It's a new design uh, that uh, has uh, membranes inside and these membranes filter the bacteria and also activated carbon that filters out the chemicals. So you can, um, for a very low cost, uh, produce uh, something like this, and then you can actually drink this water. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the, the main goal of the project is to make a very low cost uh, item uh, that can be distributed worldwide uh, and hopefully millions of people can, can use this. Uh, we've got like very small filters for like plastic bottles, but also for like a family, uh, uh, you know, in Africa and Latin America. And this can also be built into like a solar powered uh, small uh, suitcase sized uh, filter that can filter water for a whole village. Um, the vision of the project um, well, this, how this started is because I was born in Peru and in the 90s we had a huge cholera outbreak. 10,000 people died in just a, a matter of weeks. Uh, nobody knew why, but it was basically because the water was being contaminated. Uh, and even now, after so many years, 20 years, in developing countries, Latin America, Asia, if you travel there, you know, the, the main advice is not to drink tap water. So this is not only in Africa, where people have to dig wells to get water from the ground, but this actually is happening in urban areas. And uh, in developed countries, in rich countries, we consume about 20, uh, 200 billion bottles, plastic bottles every year. And that's being thrown into, into trash. Only like 30% is being recycled. Um, and yeah, this is a solution that uh, would help in developing countries, but also uh, in developed countries, in rich countries where people you know, use bottled water. Uh, with this, you can have tap, uh, tap water that maybe doesn't taste very well uh, and also filter out the chemicals like chlorine, fluoride, uh, mercury, lead. And uh, these are the models that we've been working here at POC. Um, and the new research that uh, in the next months we can do is try new materials like porous plastics and uh, antibacterial plastics so that you can actually 3D print the whole uh, filter. And, um, and yeah, I mean, that's uh, the, new, the new research that I'm doing. And uh, for the future, uh, the next steps after POC is to launch a crowdfunding campaign. You don't need so much money to actually produce these filters. And so that, you know, between us, all of the people, anyone who's here uh, and would be interested to, to help, um, you know, you can actually help by donating maybe 20 euros, and, uh, get a filter and also give one filter to a poor family in Africa or Latin America. So. Thank you.
Merci. Thank you very much. I will invite no time. Ishka. Hello, we are Gillian and Mishka, and we are part of Team no -Till. So you probably have noticed walking around the castle here, the nature is gorgeous around us. Uh, and some of us have been enjoying it very much, walking in the forest periodically uh, during the camp. And uh, nature can be beautiful, it can be relaxing, but it can also be very inspiring. For instance, if you compare a bird and our planes, uh, there is a great difference. What if our planes were as light and silent as the birds? If you look also at the, at the plants in the, growing on the forest ground and you compare it to the, the factories we have, which are polluting, noisy, ugly, uh, what, what if our everyday product could grow as plants grow? Also, we had a lot of rain over here and uh, every morning we woke up with the the smell of the of the of the soil uh, after the rain and what if processing our waste was like in nature as simple as letting things decay and grow again so basically with 3.8 million years of history on earth um, life animals plants microbes have developed many ways to live and stay on this planet and as biomimicry practitioners Gillian and I, uh, we like to dig into that, try to get inspired by how nature works and, and see how we can produce more sustainable uh, systems, designs, strategies. So, <clears throat> three years ago, we started to co-design a bio-inspired kettle. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and we took inspiration from four species, the uh, Nautilus, the polar bear, the toucan, and also the termite, uh, to make our everyday kettle more energy efficient. Uh, so we brought our designs here at POG21, and thanks to the feedback of the different experts, uh, they drastically evolved. So you will see some of our experiments in the dome. Uh, and but the journey to make the object real is going to be long, hard, uh, with many challenges to face and to overcome. So, this is yeah, okay. <laughs> so this is why we also worked uh, on a platform, uh, a platform called BioOpen, uh, made to uh, for designers and engineers on this platform. They can meet and they can co-create, co-design bio-inspired and sustainable products and services. So uh, as pioneers of this field, uh, we documented our work and our experiences uh, in a diary, which we called An Interior du Nautil. Uh, so we hope it can uh, help the bio-inspiration uh, movement to grow. And we will make it available for you to download and uh, print on the main website uh, as soon as possible. So we'll just uh, continue working on, uh, on our concepts, share knowledge, and feel free to join if you feel inspired by nature too. Thank you. The sound was a little bit weird. Is it good now? It's good. Okay, so I will invite Jason to present Shower Loop. <laughs> okay. Close, like this. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm Jason, and my project's called Shower Loop. Two, two days ago, I found out that you can't drill glass, and this happened to our shower. Um, our project's been fraught with 
destruction and demons, but it's all right. Uh, I'm not sure why I showed this slide, but anyway, let's go on forward. So I've been, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can build a sh shower loop in two days, especially if you have Tim and Marius at your side. Uh, so these guys are awesome and they've helped me uh, visualize my dream thingy. Uh, next slide, I can't remember my slides. So uh, the shower is a shower that like loops your, okay. Shower loop recycles your drink, your shower water. Oh, wait, I haven't slept in like two days or something. Just give me a second. <laughs> Okay. 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 Restart. Reboot. I'll do it real quick. So uh, the problem is that I like really, really long, hot, warm showers, but I want to be an environmentalist and do right by everything. So, so the best way to have long, hot showers and be good for the environment is to just loop your shower water and just reuse the same water over and over again. Right now it's per shower, but in the future it'll be better. So we use 10 liters of water and you can shower for as long as you want. That's pretty much it. And we have uh, these filters that, uh, oh shit, I'm really, okay, there's, okay. <sighs> okay, sorry, I'm, I'm really, yeah, I'm awesome. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so, so the, the, we use sand activated carbon and ultraviolet, ultraviolet light, sorry, to uh, clean, p p filter and purify the water so that it's drinking water quality and, oh yeah, okay, I keep forgetting the main thing, right? The main benefit is that if you reuse your hot, wa your water that's hot in the beginning, you're saving a lot of energy because instead of heating up a small volume of water or a large volume of water, you're heating up only a small volume of water by a little bit at a time. Can I see the next slide? Okay. You know, the thing is why I'm not good with the pitches and stuff is because I've been talking about this project for a really, really long time and I'm kind of bored of it and I just want to show you. So, I just got the shower to work about like 20 minutes ago or something. So please come back to the dome and just look at it and it'll make sense. It's very simple and I don't need to explain it. You'll understand it. Thank you. This is the kind of pitch we teach at POC. Um, okay, thank you, Jason. <laughs> so uh, now we're gonna go to the panel part. Um, so we're gonna talk, if I can get the slides. Yeah, we're gonna tell you. So we're gonna have a panel with all the participants about uh, design for sustainable living. So I will invite all the participants to join me on stage and we're gonna squeeze in like Dominic did and talk a little bit more about how to design for sustainable living. Test. It's the noise because I'm standing next to the speaker. I'm not the important one. Okay, so first of all, guys, um, 
thank you for being here. And um, so my name is Justina, you kind of know me already. Uh, my background is in design and architecture. So I'm going to try to ask you a few questions about how do we design and how do we turn the ideas we have into something that is uh, good for the environment, but also that people want. So the first question from my side will be, what is sustainable design for you and how can we you know, read it in your projects? Uh, yeah. For me, uh, sustain, uh, sustainable design involves a lot of, uh, like it has to be designed for people, so it has to be social. Uh, it's not just about technology or like a beautiful product, but it has to have, has to solve a really important problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would like, uh, I completely agree with Mauricio, but uh, I would like to add, like you have to give a vision to people also, kind of something kind of optimistic. Because we always talk about like sustainability as a, uh, or climate change as uh, something f uh, fatal. You say, you say fatal, fatalistic, yeah. and but you can show them uh, that you uh, you can design products, you can design organizations, something like that, with a, in a good way and in a way to give a, you know, an optimistic vision of that. Uh, for me, it's a kind of about resilience and self-sufficiency. So I think if we can empower people to kind of rely on themselves, but also survive more on their own, then they're more sus like more sustainable and more. Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Independent, autonomous, and. Uh, the financial aspect is a huge one of that and like with my project it's to like you save money also and then that frees up resources for other like-minded projects yeah i would just add up, i think I, I like your vision and i share it very much um, in my opinion what one of the main problem right now in in the objects we use and mainly objects in this room are an example is that uh, we have them uh, by like kind of crashing another parts, another population somewhere on Earth. Like all the intelligence system, for instance, uh, mainly source their their materials in in like the South, global South, being South America, Africa. And I think uh, by also relying more on self-sufficiency on autonomy, we can have a design that allows everyone to do to be what they want to be and not having one part of the world crushing the others. And what's your process? Because what you do is sustainable design. And I'm, I'm really interested in like, what is that for you and, and how you design it? What's the way, you know, the concept gets born in your head and how do you translate it? Is there a specific way that you could like teach others how to design in a sustainable way? So what we try to do um, is to so take this inspiration from nature because uh, like, yeah, again, just looking and observing how nature works, like the trees we have here, uh, they have basically solar panels, uh, which are the leaves, and they just source the materials within like four meters around their trunk. So they're kind of the example of a uh, a design also very interconnected with the other species around. Um, so this is always a source of inspiration and we try to, to formulate it in a, in a sustainable way. So with this idea of maybe like, again, if we take the example of the tree, it, makes the, it, it mainly takes its materials from um, um, dead material from other living uh, beings. So again, how can we, when we design something, source our primary material in waste from other objects we can locally source? So this is the kind of mindset, always trying to, to cross inspiration from life and sustainability together and see what we can do. Uh, for me, it was about like making it very, very, very simple. Like, you know, develop the tiniest possible filter, for example. Uh, so that was the inspiration. Uh, I'm not a designer, but I had this idea in my head and I wanted to use it for myself. I mean, I do backpacking and, and mountain climbing and I want to drink clean water. But then I saw that there's millions of people who don't have access to it. And uh, so, so maybe your personal experience can be applied to other people. I was born in a country that 
happens to have that problem. So, so that's maybe from personal inspiration you get also, you know, uh, these ideas. Uh, okay, for me, it's I'm an engineer, an environmental engineer, and then so there's a lot of tools already available that help you assess your idea or like the technical validity of it and the environmental aspects. So to me, like that stuff kind of exists and that's what I do if I have an idea then I'll try and do a bit of the math to see if it makes sense and uh, after that if it makes sense then it's just a really large amount of work to just keep going at it over and over again and that's kind of what happened here at Puck like trouble 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 but you just keep going and ultimately it'll work out you know or you yeah we, we have the same vision <laughs> on biomimicry, but uh, maybe I can add something. It's just that you can't uh, transfer like life principles uh, in human applications uh, like that. It's not so simple. That's, we have also to think to uh, the use of the things, to the cultures and uh, things like that. And maybe the best solutions uh, in nature don't work in the human uh, context. Uh, and that's a question of interpretation or how do you yeah how do you transfer that and that's kind of the design process uh, you you try to make the balance between uh, the best solution and the best thing for people and it's not always the best thing but uh, it's just you have to deal with that and another question that i ask myself often is like you know there are products on the market there is a shower on the market there is a kettle on the market there are filters and how is your project different uh, from what's already there? And could you maybe in some point explain what's the open source aspect of your project and what's its importance? Okay, so uh, what we try to do is a kettle that is drastically energy saving. Uh, and there are also other energy saving uh, uh, products around there, but we really like this idea of uh, what's the story of biomimicry can tell and how people relate to the animals uh, and how they understand the animal features we have in the kettle and it, it brings a whole new story behind it. Um, my feeling very honestly after this camp is that our kettle is over complicated and super difficult and super expensive to produce and it's only a kettle. So I know I don't share this, uh, necessarily this viewpoint with my colleague, which is way more optimistic, but in my opinion, uh, this is what happens when biomimicry is not performed in the right way. And I think we should aim for way simpler solutions, as you mentioned earlier before. So we can just discuss that later, but so uh, there, there is this, this tension to find between this very interesting storytelling and featuring and beauty and still being very simple and very efficient and yeah and the open source aspects i think we struggle all of us with a lot of challenges and if we have, can open the doors to the mentors the supporters but also the outside community and anyone interested to help of help us solve these challenges in a collaborative way that's the way we are going to be the the quickest and the more most efficient um yeah, the, the project, uh, I think it's unique because it's like the smallest format that you can possibly have. Um, and that hasn't been developed, I think maybe also for economic reasons. I mean, maybe it's not a very good business. So a big company wouldn't you know, like to develop something like this, uh, which comes down to the second point and it's uh, open. And uh, the advantage of being open is that you save a lot of uh, time, uh, research, um, yeah, costs as well to not only to develop it and to design it, but also to distribute it. Um, a lot of people are going to support you if, if it's something that, you know, people see value in it. And basically you don't have to have a huge marketing department or uh, even research or, you know, we developed a lot of things here. Uh, so, you know, the, the openness of the project, I think that's a, the main component of it. Uh, I kind of agree with the, the that part that, uh, like my, ah, my project is the shower. So I, I know it can be better and I know it could be better very, very quickly. I've spent 
I don't know, maybe 5,000 euros or something kind of developing this kind of slightly revolutionary technology or something. <laughs> but then it's, it, yeah, it's taken me so long because I didn't have money to do it and maybe other people can figure out how to do it or like together we can figure out how to do it better and share the knowledge and just get it done quickly and like push it out there so that it's like useful for everybody. That's kind of my objective, just to get it out there. The only thing I can add and what I think is very inspiring in what you're doing before I get to the last question or maybe if we have more time too, is that what you're doing is um, solutions that don't fit all you know, there are solutions that have been crafted by you to the problems that you see. So it's a, it's a basically not one size fits all, but it's a, you know, a personalized solution for thousands of problems that we have. And, and that's what open source, it's finding all those solutions for all the problems we have. I don't know if you agree, but I kind of see this as, a, as the biggest, um, you know, plus to what you're doing, which brings me to the plus and minus that you already mentioned is how did that camp uh, help you or challenged you to develop what you came uh, with? Um, and uh, I will f just put it up now and w what's happening later. The, the, the last question we had in the previous panel. I'll let you answer. Um, yeah, for me it was very easy because I, I had a huge hopes on 3D printing, for example. And the first night that I 3D printed something, I was really disappointed. And I was really, really sad and angry, and frustrated. Uh, but at the same time, three days later, because of the challenge uh, with, the, uh, with Daniel, who was you know, doing the, the, like the project lead, uh, he kind of challenged me to have something ready by, by, by the end. And I started researching, and I found like new materials and new ways of 3D printing, so like porous plastics and antibacterial plastics, and that kind of opened up, you know, like the like a new research uh, path, let's say. Um, and that was here, I, I, you know, also like developing di different designs, different models, different ideas. With Janis, who was helping me a lot with the uh, sketches, um, you know, different ways of of doing some one product. Uh, then you come up with lots of ideas and it evolves. Uh, so for me, open source is about evolution. I mean, really, you can, you can start with something and then, you know, like so many people give ideas, give proposals, uh, maybe somebody heard about something else and then why don't you do it this way or, you know, have you heard of, of this before? And then it evolves, you know, it's, it's an evolution of, and, and that's, for me, that's the most important part of open source, like to create human evolution, like use technology, mix it with people, creative people, crazy people, people who don't take showers because we also didn't take showers in the last five days. But, <laughs> um, you know, and mix it with all these inputs and at the end you have something really, really cool that works, so. I'd like to point out that Mauricio sleeps the least out of anybody here. He's 3D printing stuff at like 3 a.m. and then at 4 a.m. and at 5 a.m. I don't know why I'm awake at that time too. Um, wait, what was the question again? <laughs> well, were the challenges? Oh, the challenges, yeah. Um, and what helped as well, not only the challenges. Okay. Um, the challenges and what helped was that every time I wanted to buy something expensive, they, or not to me, you know, a couple hundred bucks for something, and then they said no. <laughs> and then, I mean, not, not you guys and not everybody, but um, it, it was actually really good, good for me. I simplified my project a lot. I changed the design. Um, I, it's, it's kind of too long and complicated to explain, but like, yeah, okay, yesterday I was gonna cut and I, I broke the glass and then it's like I need a new glass wall. So then I was gonna cut an acrylic sheet that maybe cost 300 euros. And then they said, no, don't. or like, you know, that's an expensive shower you're building. And like, okay, yeah, you're right. Um, and then, so then we started cutting some plywood and, um, um, like I, it, 
I don't know how much it costs now, but I think it's probably half of what the last one I made. So that's like real progress, and that's kind of what I want to do anyway. I want to make a really fancy, cool holographic box shower thingy that's later maybe. But um, yeah, that 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 was really really good. There was wait, there was another part of the question though. Yeah. Uh, for us, our first challenge was uh, I think uh, like the. The production costs, that's great, yeah. Uh, because we use a technology which is really, really expensive, so uh, that was not compatible with um, the way we thought the product. Like, if we want to give to people some sustainable products but which are only accessible for a few, that's maybe not the best answer. Uh, so we tried to change the techniques, to change uh, the way, yeah, it was designed from inside and also outside, just to make it more affordable, but still expensive. <laughs> yeah. In my opinion, POC21 was for us kind of a crash test uh, in the positive way, in the way they use it in the car industry to see if the car really works. Uh, it means we had all these experts like a uh, 100 people, uh, design jury, uh, looking at the product and they're each a bit and saying, yeah, this won't work, this is too expensive, this is not a good shape, this. So we had to rethink it completely. And uh, actually this very thorough um, kind of test uh, got me asking more like deep personal questions also, like, okay, why am I doing this? Why, why do I stick to that product? Why do I stick to this methodology? What, is, what are the roots uh, of all this? And um, it was very, very instructive, not very constructive in a way that we don't have a prototype in the tent, uh, we don't have, uh, we have not been as far as we wanted to, to go, but maybe it uh, was a super accelerator, like if we would have done this work alone in five years and realized this five years later, it would have been even worse. So it was uh, both very destructive and very interesting, yeah. So to repeat the last thing, are you happy and what's next? I'm super happy. Like uh, this for me, it's a dream. Like uh, combining everything from like hippie camping to uh, like <laughs> castle, living. castle living and uh, sleeping in the sofas inside the castle. Like you know, like that's that's amazing. At the same time, like there's people from all over. You're washing dishes with experts. You're cooking with experts. You clean the toilets and the shit from you know with experts and your <laughs> colleagues and. And you talk about like how can you recycle shit or can can you drink your own pee through your filter, you know? <laughs> which brings me to like the next step, which <laughs> will be. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do that, but uh, I actually asked Cassandra if it would be a viral video to drink your own pee. And I think I might do it for the crowdfunding campaign. So maybe wow. just, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's cool or too gross, but, uh, but I'm super happy. Like it, this is amazing. Really. And next, uh, yeah, to work with everyone, uh, you know, like, uh, I want to visit Berlin, come back to Paris, go to Finland, like, uh, you know, work on maker spaces. Hopefully we do like a permanent POC and, and, you know, have this environment forever like like the, this is a dream uh, so many people so many positive people everyone is open hearted um, and it's very warm like uh, one day we stayed like i don't know until like 3 in the morning and suddenly people were just hugging each other and just singing mm, for like you know it was weird <laughs> yeah but uh, that's part of everything like uh, yeah I mean, volleyball, playing volleyball, the slide, you know, the sliding sled, uh, whatever. Slide. Yeah, the slipping slide. We came up with different uh, threads uh, because they didn't work with the 3D printing. So it's one that you turn and then you have to push. Um, it's called the twist and snap. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, we started like, you know, inventing things, uh, then, you know, being frustrated because it doesn't work. Uh, Everything, like everything combined in five weeks. Uh, and that's why I'm staying a few days to dis dismantle this because it's too much to come back to normal life. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been amazing. So.
Yeah, this is a big opportunity to like thank everybody that's been here because everyone that I've met has been super awesome and like I don't know how many how you can get so many cool people in one place. So um, um, yeah, yeah. I just don't. I I don't know. Ask me in a year or something how how to describe it. Uh, it's been really cool, and yeah, I, yeah. Okay, I don't want to get into it. Yeah, um, you know, it, I had a bicycle accident like Smashed. a week before I came here, and like smashed my face and broke my jaw and everything. And I came here, and I was like, the fir first thing was like, Marguerite and Thomas were like, ah. It's the shower guy. It's Jason, and then they radioed in and like, oh, Jason's here. Jason's here. I'm like, what? Like, I've never got a reception like this before. And so, that yeah, that was really like heartwarming and nice. And then it just kind of continued throughout the whole time. So that's that's really cool. Um, what's next? Yeah. What's next? Um. Um. Uh, yeah, sleep, Jason. Yeah, uh, I'll cook you dinner and crash on your couch. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. I'll go sleep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can, can I go? <laughs> that would be a good time to go take a shower when everyone's like here. It's so like, there's no wall, wall, walls. Yeah. No, yeah, that, that was a really super rich experience with a lot of yeah great people. Uh, so now I think we we need like to take some time to uh, I don't know prendre du recul. I don't know the word in uh, in English, but uh, take a step back. Mm -hmm. Just to think about what we are going to do later. Uh, but uh, me, I have some ideas. And just, yeah, uh, in the biomimicry field, for example, yeah, yeah I'll try to push the, the catalog. We will try to push maybe the platform. And, but we're also like doing a lot, a lot of stuff uh, in biomimicry. We uh, grow objects, we grow materials, we grow a lot of things. So maybe we'll try to, yeah, to put everything together. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm very happy too. <laughs> um, it was very rich experience too. Um, for the next steps, personally, I think I will drop the kettle uh, because it's not going in a way I'm interested to go. Uh, we again take a step back and maybe I change my mind because I change my mind often. But um, otherwise, yeah, we have also a lot of interesting projects on, uh, on the go that we couldn't bring here because we can only bring one project, otherwise we don't have the time. <laughs> and, uh, but we, we will uh, continue this and, and continue trying to show that biomimicry can be interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> take some time and relax now. It's over. Thank you very much. We, we, te we tried that before and the answers were a little bit different. <laughs> So thank you. This was the first half, the first six projects. So now is lunch break. I don't know where do we eat in the orangery? Under the tent in front of the orangery, which is this direction. Hopla. Um, and uh, yeah, and after, uh, so we start again then at 2.30. And then the next half is presenting themselves of the project. So bon appétit.